This is Boomer Life on Sea Isle 650. Blue days, all of them gone. Welcome back to Boomer Life on CL 650. I'm Joanne Sutton, and thanks for joining us today. You are joining the conversation right now with the Alzheimer's Society of British Columbia. We're talking about the inner workings of the Alzheimer's Society and the core of volunteers that are necessary to support the events and programs and the governance that they offer. So in studio with us today, we have CEO Maria Howard. Uh, Maria is a bit of a mainstay with us every uh, program. We also welcome our chair of the board of directors from the Alzheimer's Society of BC. We have Michelle Buccanani joining us. And our next guest is on the telephone from downtown in the city. We would like to say hello to Krista Frazee. Hello, Krista. Hello. Hello. Now, Krista is the Provincial Coordinator of Support and Education Services for the Alzheimer's Society. I understand that Krista has a Master's in Gerontology from SFU and that her working life has given her more than 10 years of experience supporting people with dementia and their caregivers. And I also understand, Krista, that you've done a lot of research about the importance of caregiving. So uh, if I haven't said it all, what else can you tell us about yourself or maybe expand a bit on some of the things that I've mentioned? Oh, the other thing I would add to that is that I started with the society in Nova Scotia, actually, as a volunteer in 2004. And then when I moved out here to start my master's degree at SFU in 2008, I uh, started right away as a volunteer with ASBC. So I've been with the society as a volunteer since then. So what prompted you to start when you were back in Nova Scotia? Well, uh, as many of our volunteers and staff can say, I had a, a family experience with dementia. So I was very inspired to learn more about the disease and learn more about caregiving, but also to be able to give back. You know, as a, as a former caregiver, you understand the importance and the value of the support services. And so um, there were a number of times when I would say, gee, I wish I knew that that was available for me when I was caring for my grandparents. And so, so just really wanting to give that back. Well, thanks so much for that support as well. So, Krista, let me just say thank you. It's really wonderful of you to join us on our show today. And we, uh, as we carry on the conversation about the impact of volunteering, and I know that you're one of the coordinators who facilitate volunteer training for the society. So could you tell us a little bit about how volunteers are actually involved with some of the society's support services? Absolutely. Uh, and I wanted to say thanks so much for having me here today, uh, Joanne, to talk about the important role our volunteers play. It's obviously uh, National Volunteer Appreciation Week, and it couldn't be more timely to talk about the different support programs that we have through the society that our volunteers play a huge role uh, in supporting us with. So through our First Link program, uh, the society offers education we offer support groups as maria mentioned earlier i think we have over 130 support groups now throughout the province we have minds in motion we have our first link follow-up calls we have our first link dementia helpline uh, and then we also have volunteers that are helping us with a number of uh, admin related tasks in our 15 resources resource centers throughout the province so we really do rely on the dedication and and passion and support of our volunteers in a number of different capacities Wow, it sounds that they're really spread throughout the organization. And it's, it also sounds like you need a lot of support. It sounds like you need a lot of volunteers. So if you're specifically training some of these volunteers to facilitate the support groups, um, how is that being done? Do you actually offer like different training sessions for your volunteers? Absolutely. So we have a very extensive and rigorous uh, orientation and training program when we bring volunteers on. Um, so that happens in the field through our resource centers, through the support and education coordinators of First Link. Um, so that generally that process takes uh, between four to six months. They observe education, they observe support groups, they learn our website, they learn about our other programs and services. So they do as much orientation uh, to the Alzheimer's Society of BC, but also to the disease and learning a little bit about the caregiving journey. And once they complete that process, they join us here in Vancouver. So we bring our volunteers from throughout the province into Vancouver for two full days of extensive training on uh, facilitation skills. Wow. So uh, like, how many people are we talking here in the volunteer program? Are, are we talking dozens? Or are we talking hundreds? Oh, we're talking hundreds indeed, yeah. And usually for our new volunteers coming to the training twice a year, we have between 20 and 25 so twice a year we have so about 50 new volunteers coming in uh, each year for support group 
training in particular. So that's not even including our Minds in Motion and our First Link follow-up volunteers. They all get uh, their own specific training for that role. So everybody sort of comes to the table, you give them basic training, you send them out in the areas that you may recognize as uh, that uh, they'll be able to use their strengths to contribute to the programs from the Alzheimer's Society. H how do you keep that up over the course of time as we evolve and things change within the society? And, you know, to how do you Absolutely. tweak them to, well, to the keep them up to speed? Sorry. I, That's okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I get excited about talking about these. I'm excited too. <laughs> um, you know, our support group facilitators just play such a critical role in ensuring the safety of our support groups. They're really the witnesses to a lot of the pain and despair and grief and guilt and fear that comes along with living with this disease. And so we want to make sure that we prepare them well for that role before we send them out into the community to most of them are co-facilitating support groups so they have another co-facilitator who's been experienced for quite some time in that group but we really want to make sure that we prepare them with the facilitation skills that they need to be able to identify the feelings validate the feelings to to uh, bear witness to that pain just through their gift of presence we're talking a lot about helping them um, be the process facilitator of the group, so making sure that people will share the time and that they're not giving advice, that they're sharing ideas and thoughts and experiences, but not giving that invite, advice piece. But they're also uh, playing an important role in making sure that the group members are given the information and resources that they need in the community. So, you know, there's only so much that we can offer through the support groups, and then from there they connect the group members onto our field staff who... Uh, connect them with community resources, for example, when necessary. So it's a constant process of um, of making sure that the, the support group facilitators have the knowledge that they need, the foundational knowledge that they need, but also the ongoing support. And we offer that through regular debriefing. They debrief with their staff supervisors minimum once a month. Um, we have opportunities for them to uh, take part in tele-education sessions where they learn more about specific topics. We have twice a year a provincial call-in conference call for our support group facilitators where they can talk over the phone with other facilitators, talk about issues that are coming up, strategize, maybe just talk about um, some strategies that they've learned and share those learnings. And we also have regional meetings um, varies every two or three months sometimes twice a year where the support group facilitators can join other volunteers and you know it's a learning experience but it's also an experience for them to feel a part of a team we have many volunteers who are in rural and remote communities that don't get to see their staff supervisor very often they don't get to see other volunteers very often so when we can bring them together for those uh, volunteer appreciation events, it's really an opportunity for them to feel like they're engaged in a larger team. Oh my, Krista, I'm a little bit dizzy now. It sounds like really quite a massive undertaking to bring everybody up to speed. It's like a, a, an integrated complex program that you've laid out for all these volunteers, but also quite a commitment from the volunteers perspective as well. Uh, how do you find the right people? That's a really good question. I mean, um, we have a, on our website a listing of the qualifications that we're looking for, the roles and responsibilities, and the commitment. We, we do, uh, particularly for our support group facilitators, require a minimum of one-year commitment. Um, and we are upfront and honest that the first few months of that one-year commitment are going to be a little bit more time um time related in terms of their needing to spend the time with the learning and the orientation and the training piece and then after that it's about two to three hours a month um, that they commit to actually facilitating the groups but also spending that time with their ongoing learning and the debriefing with their staff and so we're upfront and honest with new volunteers when they come on and we require that that commitment is is laid out at the beginning. So, Krista, what advice would you give us um, and some of our listeners as well? If we'd like to help out, we would like to volunteer, but maybe we're a little bit nervous or apprehensive or shy that we just won't fit in. Well, um, that's a great question. I mean, thinking about, mo I, I don't want to say most, but many of our support group facilitators come to us because they've had personal experience with dementia and they want to give back, much like when I told my story a little earlier. 
but also many times they're retired professionals that they have some of the skills that uh, we are looking for already so facilitation skills listening skills uh, able to manage a group um, being able to identify commonalities and create that cohesion within groups so you know, those are transferable skills that many professionals learn in other aspects of their career. And so when they come to us being retired and wanting to give back to the community, they all already come to us often with those foundational skills. And then we just build on that in terms of helping them understand how they can fit that with our model of information and mutual aid, which is the model that we adopt in our support groups. And all that means is that it's an opportunity for people who are in similar situations, so caregivers or people with early stages of dementia, to come together and share with each other. They, they give each other support, but they also receive support. And um, so fitting those skills within that, within that model. And again, you know, the, the training is very extensive. So some of our volunteers don't come to us with a personal experience with dementia, or some of them don't come to us with extensive facilitation skills or listening skills, but we're able... Um, to with the right fit to um, teach that person, to mentor that person, coach that person, you know, in, into being the facilitator that we're looking for. Well, I, th I think you're the right person for this job. Uh, you, you've come across as you're like chief cheerleader for the volunteers. Uh, it sounds like you're going to hold our hands and, 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 and uh, work us through this program as well. Uh, do you think you're in the right job? It sounds like you love what you do. Yeah, there's no question. <laughs> no question. <laughs> Anything else that you wanted to add before we wrap up this interview today? Yeah, well, I, I do want to add a, an experience that I had yesterday that I've been reflecting on a little bit. So I mentioned earlier that we're um, at our semi-annual provincial staff meetings um, this week and our programs and services meetings. And yesterday we had the privilege of listening to Sandy Riley, who's been a longtime volunteer and advocate for the Alzheimer's Society of BC and She's recently received the Governor General's Award for the time that she's dedicated to, to our society and our cause. And what really struck me was she was wearing her, her Governor General Award pin and she touched it and then um, she said, you know, I received this pin but I believe it belongs to all of us. And she was speaking to all of the staff. But I was thinking, how can we extend that out to all of our volunteers because it really belongs to the greater team, which is all of our volunteers throughout the province as well. And so, you know, if any of our volunteers are listening to this, I just want to say that that pin belongs to you as much as it belongs to Sandy and the staff. And we couldn't do nearly, uh, we couldn't do a fraction of what we're able to do to support families and people with dementia without our volunteers. And so just taking the opportunity to thank them for their dedication and their passion. Um, but yeah, just we're so grateful for that. Well, Krista Frazee, let us uh, thank you for being a part of today's show and a part of today's conversation about the Alzheimer journey and then uh, also waving the flag for the volunteers of the Alzheimer Society. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks. It was my pleasure. So also joining the conversation today, we've had Michelle Buccanini, which is uh, a volunteer chair. She's a volunteer chair with the Board of Directors and CEO Maria Howard also in studio with us today. This week in April is Volunteer Week, and we're learning how important volunteers are to the success of the Alzheimer's Society. May 1st, also the annual Investors Group Walk for Alzheimer's. Let's see what volunteer commitment is necessary to pull off this massive event, and that's coming up next on Boomer Life on CL650. Celebrating the Boomer Lifestyle, this is Boomer Life on CL650.